We are currently in Pesach, and of course we have begun to count the Omer, moving towards Shavuot, and there's a minute to start learning Pirkei Avot at this time. Now, how do all those themes connect into one coherent idea? So we need to speak with a, we need to begin by talking about Pesach, and of course Pesach is the celebration of the Jewish people as a nation, right? We are, we're free, we've left Egypt, but as a result, we're also kind of like, well, our children, we've just been born, we're still kind of new to things, and, and we see that the, one of the messages of Pesach, of course, is our freedom, but we see after celebrating freedom uh, on the very first day, on the second night, we immediately begin to, uh, to count the Omer. And the message is, freedom is excellent and it needs to be appreciated, but after we've appreciated freedom for a day, we can move on and start seeing that freedom has a purpose, and it's moving us towards Shavuot, it's moving us towards Mount Sinai. Now, What's interesting about this is that there is a strong minhag to learn Pirkei Avot during these seven weeks. Now, what's behind this minhag? So, at least partly, it's the development of our character. Because Pirkei Avot actually doesn't talk about any any uh, halachic um, issues, right? We don't we don't learn, you know, what is a shear for after you make kiddush, right? Or what is kosher, or what does tefillin look like? Rather, it's all about a person developing this character and, and how to do that and and with the lessons we can learn from it and how to go about it. And actually, we can see this theme reflected within the Omer itself, because the Omer is actually a grain offering that was brought back in Temple times. And if we were to look closely, that grain offering would actually develop from Pesach until uh, until it was the Korban on Shavuot. Because at the beginning, right at the beginning of the Omer, we would bring a barley offerings, a barley grain offering. Now, barley classically is animal food. But as we move closer towards Shavuot, the, the grain becomes more and more refined until finally we have the finest wheat, and that actually culminates in a, sh- a special Shavuot offering, which, which is the Shtei HaLechem, uh, which are fully chametz loaves. Now, chametz loaves in general are, were very rare in the Temple times, but lo and behold, this is one of them for Shavuot. And we actually again see this reflected within Pesach, we're eating matzah, which is very undeveloped bread, until, of course, we get the chametz loaves brought on Shavuot. So again, we see this kind of gradual elevation, this this uh, this uh, this sense of ascendancy, of, of doing better and improvement. And we see that um, enacted through the Omer. Now, as part of our self-development, it is important to reflect, like, w- how, do, how do we go about this? What does it mean to be a developed person? And that is why we turn to Pir Kiyavu, because that speaks about how we're supposed to refine our character, what that's supposed to look like. In fact, uh, Rambam, in his Shmona Prakim, his eight introductory chapters to Perki Avot, in the seventh chapter, he talks about how a Navi, a prophet, in order to become a Navi, had to attain all the intellectual virtues, but had to attain most character virtues. And that seems like a bit shocking to say, but he even proves it. He says, look, look at our the tzaddikim and our, the, even the Avot back in the day. Yaakov Avinu, after all, was afraid of Esau, and that's considered a character flaw. Moreover, Shlomo HaMelech, right? One of our, one of the authors of some of the books of Tanakh, uh, he was overindulgent. And this is given over by Rambam. And Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu had a problem with rage. He, he had a problem with anger. And so we see that the, there are some character imperfections within Nevi'im. And so one of the things we're supposed to be doing over the coming weeks is improving our character. Now, um, before we even get to that, it's important to kind of take a step back and be like, okay, well, how do I know I can develop my character? And in order to answer that question, we need to address the issue of free will. Free will is, um, the existence of free will is unfortunately now even contested. There are people who buy into a, a more deterministic view of viewing things, that is to say, based on your on your genetics and your uh, experience as a child and who your parents are and all the life experiences you've had up until this point that will determine how you will react in the future. That is categorically antithetical to Torah. We do not buy into that at all as Jews. Um, we, of course, believe that we have free will, um, but we need to understand exactly how it works and where our point of free will uh, lays emphasis. And by the way, just as a general note, even in the criminal, this is an issue. If people aren't free to choose, then how can you hold them liable or guilty under the criminal? It's impossible. And therefore, the criminal law just effectively assumes that free will exists and therefore needs to either punish, I mean, generally, you're not rewarding anyone, but generally punish people uh, accordingly. Fine. So, how does free will work? 
Now, this issue is actually raised by Rav Dessler. Famously, this idea is, uh, is extremely well known in yeshiva circles, and I'm sure it's made its way out. And he expounds this in Mikhtav Meliyahu. Now, the way he explains it is as a battle. That is to say, there's a battle line. Now, generally, when armies wage war, they're, they're waging war at a specific front, right? And that's where all the heat of battle goes. You know, you get, gain 100 yards, you lose 100 yards. That's where all the action is. If you're going to look, so for example, if the if there is a war uh, a war going on at the, the border of France and Germany, then you're not going to be looking to Spain because that's there's no war being fought there. Germany is not trying to fight there because they ha they're they aren't they're nowhere near there. And France doesn't need to defend that point because that's already that's not even an issue. That's an that's not a problem. And so free will is the exact same thing. That is to say, a person needs to look at where he's standing. If a person is exceptionally well developed already, or if a person is a thug and is completely undeveloped, again, their their free will battle is waged where they stand. That is to say, let's say someone who's who's a bit of a thug, right? He you know he mugs people on a regular basis. That's how he makes his living. He has to make parnasa somehow. Um, now his free, his free will decision might be: when I mug somebody, do I beat them afterwards? Now, that could be a legitimate, a legitimate free will decision for him because for him it might not be so clear. And he's like, look, if I'm, if I'm going to rob somebody, I need to beat them to make sure they won't come after me. And so we see what happens is like this. He's mugging somebody. For him, that's not even, he knows that's the way he does. I mean, that's his business, right? That's his industry. For him, to be like, oh, should I mug somebody? That's not even a question he asks himself. However, there is something he asks himself. Once he's finished mugging, okay, now what do I do? And it's specifically at that point when he's debating whether or not to do. In fact, when a person faces total paralysis of like, should I do this or should I not do this? That is a person's free will decision. As another example, say, let's say a person is struggling with whether or not to keep kosher, right? He's kind of like on the fence, not so sure. And then he sees something that is on like Subway, right? Like a, like a veggie restaurant. It's, it's vegetarian, so there's no meat there. He generally doesn't mix milk and meat. Should I eat Subway? Should I not eat Subway? He's not sure. He, like, he's really hungry. And so he's kind of like moving into the store and moving out of the store. And he's really kind of like suspended in that kind of inability to make a decision. Should he do it or should he not do it? That is exactly where a person's free will rides. What do we mean? Because that's where the battle is waged. He's not fighting the battle of like, okay, am I going to go and, and eat like the, the meat sub with Parmesan cheese on top? He's not, that's not even a question for him. He knows he's not going to do that. Well, moreover, the fact that he'll go into like the most glad kosher place in the world, that's also, he's, he's not necessarily a holding there. He doesn't know if he wants to eat, he, that he'll for sure eat kosher. That's that's also not within his range of, uh, of decision making. Where it hangs is specifically, will I eat not like dairy out at a non-kosher place? And if that's his decision, then that's exactly where it's most difficult for him. And that's where his free will can be, can be used. On the other hand, let's say a person has an even more refined sense. Let's say a person never steals, right? He's very, he's very refined in that way. Um, brought up with good parents in a good, good school system. He's had very positive influences in his life. And so he would never steal, right? He's not like the thug. For him, stealing, he would never take a gun to somebody. He would never throw a brick in, into the window. However, for him, what might be a legitimate decision is let's say he's paid on an hourly basis, right? Now he needs to decide, well, am I going to text while I'm still charging for this hourly basis? Because at the end of the day, if he does, let's say he decides to text for five or ten minutes, right, during an hour. Let's just say for convenience's sake, he's paid 30 bucks an hour. If he texts for ten minutes or he's on Facebook for ten minutes, if he's not working for those ten minutes, one-sixth of thirty dollars is five dollars. He's effectively stolen five dollars from his employer. Now, for some people, that's not even that's not even a debate. Of course they're going to text. That's not a problem, right? But what, what is an issue, if he realizes, like, you know, probably, like, maybe shouldn't be doing this, but it's really convenient, and that is exactly where a person's fr uh, free will lies. And so, again, to sum up the idea, a person's free will lies at the point where you feel a certain sense of paralysis, where you're thinking, should I do this, or should I not do this? That is where a person's able to, to, to choose and to make a free will decision, and that is how you make progressions in terms of uh, of our character. If it's if it's a decision that's easy for us, like, of course I'm going to give charity, well, then you're not really developing your character at all. But if it's giving charity in a certain way, with a more positive atmosphere, instead of looking at beggars like they're the lowest scum the, on earth, but rather giving them a smile and making sure that they feel good about themselves or anything like that, that's where the free will decision is to be made. And that's where progress is to be made on our characters. And with that, we'll say 
Gliamatov'dan şu başlamanın 